This is the Team Sidelined Podcast, a podcast launched to support the mental game of student-athletes during these extraordinary times of COVID-19's impact on life and sport. Brought to you by Sidelined USA. We invite athletes, performance coaches, and resource experts to discuss coping skills, strategies, and mindset work, which have proven to help sidelined athletes face their adversity, build resilience, and forge forward even stronger. And now, here's our host, Executive Director of Sideline USA, Christine Pinalto. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Physical therapy is usually the thing you're told to do after medication, x-rays, or even surgery. But what if the best way to fix your pain is to start where you normally finish? The sooner you start with physical therapy, the sooner you can start changing everything. It all starts with no prescription needed at Athletico. And now, Game 3, Getting Real About Depression. Four athletes discuss pressures, identity, and purpose. Neither Sideline USA nor its affiliates provide clinical or medical care of any kind via their relationship with Sideline. At no time should a user have an expectation of clinical care or professional services offered or rendered. Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking about depression and anxiety. I've got several guests with us today, all former athletes who have experienced a medical exit from sport, have experienced mental health related to that medical exit, and even some just, you know, throughout related to injury. I think it's really pertinent right now, especially as so many athletes are unexpectedly cut off from their sports due to the pandemic restrictions one way or the another, there's just a lot of impact. A lot of athletes who want to be on the field, who want to be on the court, who want to be on the track and are not able to do so. And it really does um, impact us emotionally. It's a very normal thing to have an emotional impact for that. So what we've done today is we brought along some guests to just talk about their experience with that, share their um, struggles with mental health as a, an athlete and what that entails, I think it's different than the average person because of the stigma, because of the expectations on athletes to have it all together and to handle themselves in a way where they're always ready for anything, no matter what. So we'll talk about those pressures. We're going to dive in, but first, let me go ahead and give you some introductions here so we know who we're talking to. Alyssa, we've got Alyssa Voitry. Alyssa, raise your hand. There you go. So Alyssa had experience with concussions in high school with hockey in her junior year, and she ended up um, having depression and anxiety related to that when it caused her to medically retire, as well as some experience with mental health in college as well in her experience as an athlete with cross country and track. Next, we've got Aaron. Aaron Walter is, um, was a former professional soccer player for the St. Louis Athletica. She was a midfielder and she experienced a lot of injuries, hip injuries in, in, in particular that eventually separated her from her sport and caused her to medically retire, uh, experienced a lot of um, mental health issues related to that exit. Jackie Mercer, uh, Jackie is a former lacrosse player for uh, Temple University. And she experienced multiple ACL injuries and experienced depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, associated with those injuries uh, throughout college and beyond uh, due to the aftermath of those injuries and her medical retirement. And then our solo male guest today is representing um, testosterone is Jonathan Meldrum. Jonathan is a former Syracuse um, linebacker, defensive Offensive tackle. Offensive big line. Offensive line. I had that wrong. Okay, That's I'm okay. sorry. Offensive line. Um, and he experienced depression um, prior to his medical exit, but also because of his medical exit. So he has experience in, um, with some chronic kind of depression from a younger age and then throughout his experience as a D1 athlete. So everybody, welcome. That was kind of a really speedy way to introduce everybody. Um, but thanks so much for being a part of this conversation. I know that these topics are really uh, raw and, and tough and mental health struggles don't just go away. So I know um, it's something that it's important to keep talking about. Just thank you so much. I think this can be a very powerful episode. We're going to start off with a rapid fire. So for our podcast listeners, I'm going to translate for you the hands that are raised and let you know what people are saying for those. But let's just get to some uh, experience here with 
learning a little bit about who we're talking with and what your experience has been. So first question, all of you suffered from depression. Show of hands, how many of you also suffered from anxiety? Oh, everybody, all four. Um, identity loss, all four, again. And suicidal thoughts. Okay, thank you. Three out of four also experienced uh, suicidal thoughts. How many of you felt pressure to hide your struggles with mental health because of being an athlete? Raise your hand. Four, four out of four. Okay, everybody. How many of you felt guilt or shame associated to your mental health struggles? Again, all four. How many of you attempted to handle things on your own when it came to your mental health? Three out of four. And how long, for those three, how long would you say that you did that, you tried to handle it on your own before voicing your struggles with somebody? Too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with, with Alyssa on that one. Yeah. Years. Too long. Years. Years, okay. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. All right. Here's one for each of you. In one word, describe how you felt in your mental health journey during the time before you reached out for help? One word or a hyphenated word. That's okay too. Uh, I would say drowning. Mm. Drowning. Yeah. Um, what were you going to say, Jonathan? I was going to say uh, just like a hopelessness, just no desire. <laughs> I would say lost. And I would say purposeless. Mm. Yeah. Those are strong words and heavy words, heavy emotions to feel. Thanks for sharing those. Um, so we'll start off with this. Why do you think so many athletes don't express what they're going through when it comes to mental health struggles? Uh, Jackie, let's go with you. I think obviously, as we know, the sports culture, it's it's ingrained in us. Um, I think it's become less and less, you know, uh, like that over the years. I know 10 years ago when I was going through my stuff, it was still very new. Um, sadly to, to open up about that. I think it's not easier now, but I do think more people are stepping up and speaking up. I didn't want my teammates or my coaches to like judge me or think that, you know, cause I was judging me. So if I was judging me, you know, they must be thinking something and I'm someone that cares a lot what other people think. So, um, and especially when you're a part of a team, you don't want to let people down. And I think, especially when you're, you want to play and you want to be in the game too. I know that I struggled with that even coming back from my first injury. Like I was mentally struggling, um, and physically struggling. And I didn't say anything because I didn't want to not be put in the game because I didn't want to be, a, I didn't want to appear weak. Mm -hmm. And I actually heard somebody talking about that the other day on a podcast and um, it just really resonated with me. It's just like that feeling of not being able to be relied on and, you know, it's ingrained in you as an athlete that the, the name on the front is more important than the name in, on the back all the time. And it's like, well, when does that, when does it become the other? When is it important to prioritize you, you know, especially if you're a part of a team sport um, or you're a coach or anything like that. It's like, when do you prioritize your health? So I think, Overall, it's just like ingrained naturally in athletes to just like tough it out. Um, but you're also toughing it out by like living with this every day and and still choosing to push forward. And I think that that conversation has started to change recently, which is really good. Right. Well said. Uh, Jonathan, I'm curious for you, in what ways would you hide your struggles from your teammates, from, you know, whoever it might be, your, your, your family, your roommates, your, your coach? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, you know, everything that Jackie said, you know, I, th I think that's universal uh, for me, as far as trying to hide, just putting a, a smile on every day, you know, trying to make it through. I mean, I, I know last time we did our interview and, and I've mentioned multiple times before, you know, this idea that uh, I would have like these little minor or minor or major meltdowns, like before practice, like in my car, like in my apartment. And I would just 
you know, be sobbing and crying, trying to hold it together and try to like exhaust myself as much as I could in that front before I went into the locker room or before I walked onto the practice field. I mean, there was times I'd be in the stall in the locker room, like trying to like pull it together. Um, you know, a few people knew about like, you know, my struggle with depression and things like that throughout my playing career and throughout my life. My roommate, you know, thankfully um, was an amazing guy. And to this day, we're still best friends, but he always knew kind of when I was in my cycle. And so he would do as much to try to lighten the load and try to make things easy on me. Um, he kept that between me and him, you know, in hindsight, you know, I wish he probably would have spoke up sooner, probably would have made a, a change with, with the way I was acting and behaving, but you know, I would be this happy-go-lucky guy and be like, you know, total fake it till you make it mentality of, you know, bouncing off the walls and doing this and then like going home and then absolutely just crashing and sleeping for 12, 15 hours or, you know, trying to skip class so I could, you know, get extra sleep and, and stuff like that. So it was just this constant facade that everything was great when obviously it wasn't. And I mean, you can only carry that mentality on for so long until you finally start cracking and essentially that's what happened with me is I carried it for so long until somebody cracked me in in a moment of weakness in my eyes and then like everything just came spilling out which was my saving grace because that's when I got the help that I needed so yeah I hope that, I hope that answered the question yeah thanks for sharing I I can only imagine um you know your experience with that Aaron Tell us a little bit about your experience. Sure. So I think it looked different. Um, I suffered probably three years after my surgeries uh, when I finished playing. And that looked different than I'm actually trying to find my way through depressive episode as we speak. I had my last, my sixth hip surgery, like, I don't know, 10 weeks ago. So um, for me, it, it was all about thinking, and it still is that I should be able to do, I should be able to get through it and I should be able to figure it out because that's what the, my entire life has been. You know, you don't think you can make it through another double day in preseason, but you do, you don't think you can track someone down in the 87th minute, but then you have the legs to do so. So you just get this perfectionist mentality of, of being able to fight through everything and get through everything that this looks no different. And so you realize what you're feeling, you realize you're struggling, but you can't get through it in the way that you think you should, which then just piles on top of everything and makes everything worse. Cause now you feel like a bigger failure than you felt like before. So it's, um, and, and without being able to get through things and without being able to exercise or do activities, it's like this, what brought the purposelessness out is what, what am I doing here anymore? I don't understand. Right. I'm sure that a lot of pandemic sidelined athletes kind of read you know that resonates with them I mean there's a lot of life that looks very different right now um certainly with online classes being something that most athletes have had to or are currently dealing with let alone the separation from their teams and the ability to practice together or you know maybe it's a limited number of practices per week allowed in person. There's definitely a lot of separation. There's a lot of, I think, difficulty from what I'm, you know, for what we're hearing, there's a lot of difficulty with apathy, with, you know, just that motivation and that drive, which obviously is kind of the first in a way step toward, you know, into depression where it's where you lose that drive that you're so used to. Um, Alyssa, I'm curious how, what depression and anxiety look like for you? Um, well, I kind of noticed a couple things. This is all hindsight. You know, I don't, I didn't necessarily notice it while I was going through it. I don't think, I think I thought that, oh, everyone struggles with this. And so it's no big deal. Or I kind of compounded it into, you know, I've had concussions. So my brain's a little messed up. And so some things I can't process or, something like that. And so I think going through it at first, you know, in high school, um, had some bad head injury stuff go on and, um, had to stop playing hockey, which, um, at the time was more of an isolation factor of sorts. You know, I, I actually had to like stop playing. I could only sit on the bench, um, at that point and no one really understood what I was going through. You know, I was missing school. Teachers didn't get it, all these things. And so 
that isolation made me feel like I had to isolate because no one was understanding and no one knew exactly what I was going through. And so I didn't really try to explain because I didn't want to be misunderstood or I didn't want to feel like stupid, I guess. Um, but because I dealt with that that way and I chose to stop feeling, you know, I, I avoided sad. I avoided all those vulnerability moments that I could have shared how I was feeling with somebody. Um, and that kind of followed me through college. You know, I got the opportunity to run in college, which was great. Um, but that feeling of, you know, not being vulnerable and just like putting my nose to the grindstone and keep working hard um, and all that stuff kind of brought out even more of that perfectionist, people pleasing anxiousness within me um, to the point where really, you know, it was beyond just like people only noticed that I was nervous at meets, you know, obviously everyone gets nervous before competition of some sort, but it, it was way beyond that. And I wasn't letting anyone see kind of like Jonathan said, you know, just put on your, put on your smile or just um, kind of fake it till you make it per se, um, which in turn caused so much heaviness and struggle um, that maybe could have been avoided if I just was brave enough to simply open up and talk about it in the first place. Cause what started with the concussion followed me all the way through college because of my coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. So. Sure. And we're going to get to this a little bit later, but um, I, I believe that there's a lot of athletes out there who aren't giving themselves permission to, you know, lean into how they're feeling because they know that everyone's in the same boat. Like everyone's separated from their sport right now, if they're, you know, on the same team. And in that regard, there's a, a whole different layer of comparison for you. You were comparing to the athletes who got to keep playing, but for the athletes currently, it's like, I'm just one of 30 who are all struggling with this. How do I give myself, you know, why should I not be able to handle this and other people can. So if that's something that resonates with you as a listener, like you, you need to keep hearing, you need to keep listening you need to keep hearing these stories because your experience is valid. And it doesn't matter what anyone else's experience is. It's your experience and it, your feelings matter and your mental health matters. Um, Jackie, let's roll it to you talking. I know that you probably heard a lot of your story within the other um, guests experience, but is there anything that you want to share and add about your particular journey? Yeah, I think making the point that, I mean, I feel like everyone has a different background. Everyone's grown up in different environments. I think everyone's got their own, they're wired differently. Um, and that's not necessarily anyone's fault. I know with me with therapy, I mean, I still go to therapy every week. Um, and I, I go in spouts in between of anxiety and depression all the time. So, um, it's something you have to practice and keep working at. Um, but you know, the biggest thing is like, I had to forgive myself and realize like, just because, this person dealt with their injury one way doesn't mean I had to deal with that that way. I think I was young when everything happened to me. Um, and I think it, whether you're young or old, honestly, like you're wired different. I know that depression runs, runs in my family. Um, so it was kind of bound to hit me at some point, I think. And, um, it's unfortunate, but it, you know, I think there, for me, for my situation, there was a combination of, a history of mental health that I didn't really even know that I was developing like a, a, an issue. Um, you know, I was still kind of growing into that and I didn't, I wasn't shown that light until I got injured. Like I wasn't really shown that I didn't have any other coping mechanisms other than playing my sport until I got hurt. And that kind of spiraled me into, I don't know how to navigate this. I don't understand what I'm feeling, why I'm feeling this way. Why is somebody else, you know, able to process this differently than me? Um, And then when I had my second injury, I didn't deal with the first one right. And I kind of beat myself up for the, for the depression that I had from that. And I still didn't really overcome it. I put on the smile. I acted like everything was fine. And then I had my seat, my career ending injury. And that just, I obviously didn't cope with everything well all the way through, which affected me later on in my life. It all, it all came back and returned. And I think that's the main thing, like main point that I think we'd all want to make is that this isn't just like a right here, right now thing, like while you're injured, this can affect you throughout your life. If you don't, you know, deal with it and get help. Um, 
And it's very hard for 18, 19, 20 year olds. It's hard for me as a 30 year old to ask for help sometimes. So, you know, it's especially with kids and with, with the student athletes right now, that having that support and breaking the stigma is like the most important thing to be able to get people to start normalizing opening up. So. For sure. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm wondering you guys, I'm wondering this, I'm wondering if any of you were surprised that you struggle with, you know, mental health, depression, anxiety, whatever, as you know, knowing your personality, were any of you surprised when that happened to you or would other people be surprised to learn that about you um, at that time? I've had a lot of people come to me since opening up and, and speaking about it that um, they were super surprised. I know uh, the last podcast that you and I did, Christine, um, I shared that with a lot of my teammates and, and shared it on Facebook and stuff like that. And I had so many people reach out and they're like, oh my goodness, like, you know, I was going through the same exact thing that you were like, you know, it's so refreshing to hear, you know, somebody open up and talk like that. And, and I think that, um, you know, that's, that's been one of my biggest motivators um, with sharing my story is, you know, it's amazing how athletes now and back when I was playing, that all of us were struggling in some way, shape or form, right? It's, it's hard to be a college athlete. It's hard to be a professional athlete and go and put out every single day and, and, and be expected to maintain this level and not have some type of breakdown and not have a wear on you. And then you add injuries on top of that. You know, it's not fun, you know, playing a sport when you're hurt or you're trying to recover and trying to be positive and you're having to put the extra time, not only on the field, but also in the training room to, you know, take care of your body and make sure that your mind's good and, and maintain grades. And so, you know, sharing and opening up has, has been people, people have looked at me now and been like, I, you know, I would have known in a million years that you were depressed or, you know, suicidal or thinking about ending your life. Uh, when you were at Syracuse and, you know, we appreciate it. And I've had, you know, high school kids and other coaches in different States reach out to me that have, you know, heard my story and, you know, ask me to talk to their kids or, you know, ask me questions about how to navigate, you know, what they're going through. So, you know, I just think it's, it's so powerful to open up and share that because you just really don't know who's going through the same exact thing that you are. But when you're depressed and you're feeling anxious, like you feel like you're the only person in the world that's really going through that. So, um, you know, that's that's what makes this whole thing just that much more important, especially in today's world where kids are just getting sidelined left and right. And it's not even their fault. So, yeah. Thanks for that. I see a lot of nodding heads from our other guests. I think we all agree with that. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Um, I think too, you know, with, with my story in particular, um, kind of right off the bat, like I said, I didn't really realize I was struggling with something. I thought that was normal for some reason. Um, and that was just because of lack of vulnerability and processing, I think. But as I got into college, I kind of accepted I had anxiety, but that's where I would stop. I wouldn't talk about it after that. So I think when I talked about it most, it was at a competition type situation where we were talking about, you know, oh my gosh, I'm nervous for this or I'm nervous for that or whatever. Like, oh my gosh, I'm anxious um, on the bus ride there or whatever. But I think when kind of, as we've said, as it kind of compounded and I kept um, coping poorly, I guess, with those different things, and I didn't talk about it at all. Um, and it finally came to a peak. I was at the point where I would cry putting on my shoes in the locker room to go to practice. Like I hated going to do what I love to do. I hated it. It was this weird conundrum that I was struggling with. And it got to the point where it was just like, you need to be done. And I never had voiced any of this. Um, maybe a couple times with my coach here and there that I wasn't enjoying it. Um, but besides that, I hadn't talked to any of my teammates. So when I quit, it was this idea of like, well, what the heck? you know, everyone was frustrated versus like, are you okay or anything like that? Because I had never voiced that I was even struggling at all. And so I think sometimes, you know, there's power in that vulnerability to be real because I know other people were struggling too. I wasn't blind to that, but because I didn't voice it, it came across differently, you know, or maybe that I was being angry or just like 
leaving them high and dry per se, rather than like, hi, I'm struggling. And I know you guys are too, and we can figure it out together. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Appreciate that. Um, let's talk about getting help and what that looks like. I think in a lot of ways that can be a very scary thing because we don't, you know, talk about, we talk about getting help. You hear that message a lot, but we don't talk about what that looks like to ask for help. Who do you seek out? Who, you know, what advice can you guys give based on your own experience with reaching out for help or perhaps maybe, you know, without reaching out for help, but you wish you did. What advice could you give to an athlete who's struggling but doesn't know who to talk to about it? Who do they, who do they look for? Who do they voice this with? Ideally, I'd like to say coaches, but, you know, in my experience, I, I've found that that's not always the easiest um, way to go. I, I would say that in – in today's times, I think coaches are becoming more aware of what mental health looks like in, in, you know, athletes, you know, from high school to collegiate to professional. I think that's more of an understanding, but also at the same time, never in a million years would I have gone to one of my coaches and been like, hey, coach, like I'm sad, I'm depressed because I was deathly afraid of being called a pussy or being called weak or being called, you know, or not, or, you know, having them think that I, I wasn't able to perform. I would say probably the best person to go to if like you are having a hard time is go to your athletic trainer. Like that's what they're there for. Um, Tim Neal, who I know you've worked really closely with Christine. Um, I love that man. And I owe that man a huge amount of gratitude because if it wasn't for him, you know, really stepping up and like getting in my face and being like, you know, you're going to do this. Um, I really don't know where I'd be at. And so I've always told, like, go to your athletic trainer. Like, I, I know they're there to take care of you physically, but also mentally as well, especially when you get to the collegiate level. Um, you know, open up, talk to your parents, talk to teachers, talk to, you know, everybody. Just because you're an athlete and you're suffering from depression doesn't mean that your only resource is, you know, your teammates or, you know, people within whatever program you are. Reach out to whatever resource you have to get the help and the support that you need to, to share exactly what you're going through. That's really, really helpful. Thank you, Jonathan. I was super triggered by that question. You were, let's yeah. start with that. And then when, when Jonathan said, well, I want to say a coach um, <laughs> and I'm not somebody that like, I don't, I don't want to put, I mean, people know who I played for, so they're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, I think over the years, hopefully we learn, right? We, just like we learned to cope better. Um, I know for me, I remember like literally hysterically crying in my coach's office because she had brought me in and this was after my first injury. Um, and I had put a lot of pressure on myself because when I came in as a freshman, I already went in with like an underdog mentality. I just, I have always been that way as an athlete. I just always felt like I was playing catch up and not really giving myself the credit that I probably deserved at the time for working hard. Um, and I had come off of a starting season right when I, I tore my ACL the year after I started as a freshman. So I was starting to get confidence in myself and then that happened. And so coming back was really hard for me and it was a huge struggle. And I just, from going back to the previous question about were people surprised, I was this person that was like super outgoing and super happy and just like, just excited about life and goals and motivated all the time. And I went from that to the complete opposite um, after, you know, my, when I was sidelined and my coach at the time, obviously it was, it was kind of hard to hide that. I didn't speak up. I didn't tell anybody about it, but you could kind of see it on my face. I was just like walking around like a rain cloud, which is okay. By the way, I just want to let everybody know you're valid to do that. Um, but at the time, uh, I guess I didn't realize how much that that was affecting the people around me. And, um, instead of like getting a huge amount of support, I was told by my coach, Jackie, when you're up, when you're really up, you bring everybody up. And when you're down, you bring everybody down. Mm -hmm. And like, as a coach, like, 
you don't say that <laughs> to somebody. Um, and it, like, and it's not like it was just an angry, mean thing that I wasn't going around being mean, but I was not my happy self. I wasn't what the team needed. And um, I think there's coaches out there that, that do not do that. I think there's coaches out there. I want to give them credit that, you know, there's people that probably did help. Um, but I think agreeing with Jonathan starting somewhere and like, okay, if the coach isn't going to be helpful, try the trainer. Okay. then try a teammate, then try your parent or guardian, then try a really close friend. Like just keep trying and don't give up until somebody listens because if, because what I did, I just completely gave up. Um, I, although I did have a trainer who was super helpful, um, and, and tried, like really tried to get through to me. But at that point I had already had that like mindset in my head that like, I'm just bringing everybody down and it just brought me down further. And, um, I probably should have spoken up to friends and family didn't do that. Um, so I kept, kept internalizing it. So my advice would be just keep for support number one, support yourself. And like you said, feel valid in everything you're feeling. And number two, do not stop trying until if, until somebody listens to you. And it could be researching, like Google's a great thing. Look up for, look up resources, like be resourceful. Um, you know, sideline, hopefully it'll pop right up. Uh, and you know, just, just don't give up in trying, just, just keep going as tough as it gets. And if people really, it's, doesn't seem like they're understanding just keep trying like I totally get the whole like coach thing um so you know hopefully coaches these days are are improving on that for sure and that's great advice I mean there's still there's still a lot going on there's a lot more to people to that can you know be empowered to learn better ways and a lot of people are stepping into that other people are still learning it's not your fault like like you said Jackie keep pressing, keep advocating for yourself because, um, what you're experiencing deserves that and you deserve that. So let's make a little bit of a transition towards talking about, talk about, you know, what depression and anxiety, what mental health struggles can look like. We talked about the impact of that on a personal internal level. We talked about, um, what it can look like to reach out for help. Now let's talk about what help has looked like for you guys. Um, tell us a little bit, uh, maybe I'll, I'll let anyone start, just kind of like, let me know you want to take this one, but what are some of the most helpful things, both professional help that you sought or strategies and tips and things that have helped you manage your depression over time? I can start. Um, I think that I kind of wrote them down so I didn't forget. <laughs> um, when I, you know, kind of going back to move forward, I resonate with the coach thing 100%. Um, I feel like a lot of times coaches say that they're available open door policy until something goes very wrong or there's a struggle that maybe they don't feel equipped to help with. And rather than like helping lead you somewhere else, they just kind of like are frustrated too. Um, and I, it, a lot of it probably is because they care and they care about the like the team or like the health of the program in general. Um, and they feel a little bit limited in that area. Um, at least I'd like to hope so. I don't know that, um, they just have this ill will per se, but, um, I think that fi finally, you know, pivoting and trying first to coach and then thinking like, okay, well, I know that there's a counselor at school who used to be an athlete, you know, I just, he had come and spoken to the team before. So going and finding somebody, you know, maybe even a professional or someone where you know that they've been there, um, whether it's through sideline resources or otherwise is important. Um, and I think that really helped me not only just like share my side, because sometimes I feel like I was like, okay, you're, you're being ridiculous or you're, you're playing, you're playing the victim or you, you know, you just, you just start holding on to it too much or something like that, but being able to share that side and then in turn feel <laughs> whatever emotions I was suppressing was first important. And then I think secondly, being able to then after sharing the story or stories of like what has been very impactful and hurtful to you, um, being able to find like narrow that down and weed that out to find your triggers, um, whether it's depression or anxiety or both, because I feel like they kind of go hand in hand 
you know, I would be anxious and then I'd be upset because I was anxious and it was just this constant cycle. But, um, finding out your triggers for me, for example, uh, it kind of narrowed down to three, um, not operating at a hundred percent perfection. You know, I kind of was a perfectionist and a people pleaser. Um, and then also under people pleasing, kind of like a being misunderstood and feeling like I'm not good enough or I'm not enough. Um, and those three things could kind of be pinpointed in every story I told and every anxiety situation that I spoke about to this counselor, to this, to these people, um, that was kind of the common theme. And so being able to do that, um, then you're able to see, okay. And then you're able to start figuring out how, how to cope and how to change where, okay, my identity isn't in this. Um, my identity isn't in me being an athlete or how good I am or how, bad I played or what my times are, what my marks are or any, you know, anything I'm good or bad at, it doesn't have to be sports. It can be a job or anything else, you know, like being able to pinpoint that and say, that's not my identity. Therefore that doesn't tell me if I'm good enough or not. That's one little pinpoint in my grand scheme of life. And so being able to do that, I think is super important. Um, and lastly, I think staying off of social media, <laughs> you know, being able to limit what you're intaking there. And that can be a really good resource because a lot of people can go to sideline and find resources there and that type of thing, or they can have like, um, positive accounts that they follow or, you know, um, where Bible verses and good quotes pop up and that helps. But sometimes even those positive things can bring you down because you're coming from a space of, Oh my gosh, I can't get out of this. And everybody else seems like they're so much better off. And so I think limiting that time on there and whether you realize or not that you're feeling that way, I think that it's important to realize that that happens subconsciously and it's okay to like delete that app for a few days or something at a time, just to make sure that you're good and you're checking in with yourself, with yourself, by yourself. All right. I think that's really good. I know a lot of people have been t- taking breaks from social media during this pandemic for, you know, that exact reason and amongst a lot of just, you know, it's very difficult right now for many reasons on social media, it can be helpful and help you connect or it can have the opposite effect all of a sudden and that can kind of sway depending on the day. Um, Aaron, I really appreciated when you just were super honest earlier and you said, hey, I'm actually pulling out of a depressive episode um, currently. It was not lost on me that takes incredible courage to show up to a talk about depression and anxiety, a panel when you know that you're going through it currently. And I just wanted to, first of all, say thank you for being here during that time. I know just motivation in general to do anything and to feel any connection to a positive, um, you know, like I'm going to give something, someone, someone, something good to think about is very hard in that moment. So just wanted to honor that moment. But I also wanted to capitalize on the rawness of your experience right now by asking you this question Um, certainly I know you mentioned the additional surgery that you've had to have, um, has played into your experience with, you know, your, your, your current episode. Can you tell us what are the kinds of things that you're doing to, to stay head above water right now? Sure. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is it was figuring out where my safe spaces were safe spaces, meaning people that I could be around and be completely vulnerable. Um, and for me, that was my boyfriend and my therapist and those two people, I had committed to myself to at least continue to talk to them at all times. So even when things got really ugly and, um, you know, I had suicidal thoughts and I had no idea what my purpose was. I had those people who had my back and were listening to me and could reach out to me if they thought that I was in danger. Um, and so those safe spaces were super important. And my therapist had recommended, both my psychologist and psychiatrist had recommended I do a partial hospitalization program. And it took me a long time to be okay with, I guess, going and getting an assessment just because it felt weird. There was like a stigma for me around it. And I went and I did it. And then I signed up and I started and four minutes into the first call, I left the Zoom call and I haven't returned. And it was a little difficult for me to admit. And I was like, I just quit something. I don't quit things. But then I reframe the problem and it's like, I didn't give up on myself and getting out of this depression. I just needed a different method to work through it. That one wasn't for me. It might be for other people, which is great, but it wasn't for me. So for me, it's just been continuing to work with my therapist and work on some of these workbooks, um, talking things through, 
um, continuing to adjust some of the medications that I'm taking. So the tools have all been different. And um, I think the hardest piece for me is understanding what kind of thoughts I should have, knowing exactly how I should look at my problem, my life, my uh, situation with my uh, inability to work out and do what I want to do. I know how I should look at it, but it doesn't feel right to me. So I can say it, but I don't feel it. And that's been a hard thing for me to, to try and get to the point where I do feel it. And I'm still not there yet. Um, and so hopefully these workbooks just actually ordered them this morning because I spoke with my therapist yesterday. Hopefully they help and they start uh, reframing the way that I'm thinking about myself and thinking about life um, and, and can help me continue to push through. Yeah. Wow. It sounds like you have a, a good therapist. I think that idea of um, the disconnect between what you think and you know, you, you know, in general believe versus how you feel can be a trigger because it's like, then that's where the guilt and shame comes in where those don't match and you can't force it to match. And like, how do I have the tools to, for, to make those two match where I can bring my feelings up to match what I know to be true. Um, the things I've been, you know, doing haven't been working in that regard. And, and that's where we want to really encourage our listeners that is the power of therapy. That is the power of people who are experienced with these things, giving you actual tools to, um, to, to practice with. You're not on your own to, to know what helps people out of these situations and out of these down spots and how do we climb out? I mean, you've obviously, you know, if you're struggling right now, you're listening, you've obviously tried a lot of things on your own. And I would just encourage you, um, you know, don't be afraid to talk to somebody because whatever you say to them, it is not the first time they've heard it. It is, you know, they've heard this multiple times over and they have the tools to help you. Um, Alyssa, what did you want to add to that? Well, I just wanted to say, I thought it was really cool. Thank you for sharing. First of all, I know that's not easy. Um, and hopefully that's a little bit healing being able to share, but I think that it's really cool that you said, you know, like I didn't quit. I, I, I didn't, I stopped doing that because it, it didn't help me. It, it wasn't right for me. It wasn't the method that helped me most. Um, and being able to give yourself permission and, you know, advocate for yourself that way, I think is important too. Like finding a therapist isn't like a, a one-time deal. Sometimes you don't have that connection with somebody and you have to try a few different people. Um, or, you know, sometimes they give you some coping techniques and you just don't believe them in your head or something like that, you know, like, you're like, that doesn't work. Or even though I know that's true, I don't know that in my heart. And so it doesn't help me cope with my anxiety or my depression or whatever I'm struggling with. And so I think being able to advocate like that is super cool that you were able to do that. And I think it's important for everybody to remember as they're trying to navigate this process in general. Um, Cause it's not going to be like a first try. Everything's going to get better right away. It's going to take some time and that's okay. I think it also says a lot about your journey and where you are and how hard you've worked. So I, I also want to say thank you. Cause I think that's so brave to like, I know on my worst day these days, I probably couldn't do this right now. So the fact that you are here and, you know, helping so many people, I think says a lot about you. Thank you both. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thanks, Sarah. And like I said, you know, I just had my knee replaced. November 4th. And I know leading up to it, I was having a conversation with my girlfriend. She's like, well, are you scared about the knee surgery part? And I said, no, like I'm, I'm more scared about getting depressed. Cause like, I know how after surgery, how I get, and that was kind of my downhill spiral in college was coming off of a major surgery. And so like throughout this whole process, and there's been a lot of hard nights and hard days just dealing with you know, yet another surgery on, on my knee um, for the better, but, you know, it's so easy to, you know, get stuck in the house and to get stuck in bed and just be like, you know, and I've, I've had to catch myself multiple times because I've like laid in bed, like just miserable and pain and been like, I just give up. And my girlfriend's like, you can't give up. Like, that's just not something that you do. Like, <laughs> like you're doing this to get better. So like, I've had to be super vigilant about it because like, I felt myself slip a, a couple of times. I'm not to where my lowest point has, has been in the past, but it's definitely something I, I feel that, um, you know, when I get down, I have to be super aware of because it's so easily to get stuck back into that, 
that mentality of just being like, you know, I just give up. Like, I don't care. And like things just lose their excitement and you just, you're just flat. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. And Jonathan, the way you talked about having, you know, feeling defeated and like, Oh, this again, you know, I have a feeling a lot of athletes right now who are listening, who are, you know, trying to get back to regular play resonate with that. This maybe it's not an injury for them, but I mean, we just had this huge wave again of, you know, impact on winter sports now, and which is looping back to the beginning, which is basketball and all of the spring sports that got shut down in March. Mm -hmm. And now it's impacting those athletes again. And so there is this looping effect, you know, the bad news that loops back and you motivate yourself. And then all of a sudden you're just like, I, I totally understand what you're saying where it's like this idea of just like this again. Yeah. And I think we're in a this again moment in this pandemic, all of us, not just athletes, but all of us. I mean, you know, moms and teenagers and, um, you know, anybody like it's, it's tough. And so, um, just recognizing that that is normal. And just like your girlfriend said, it's like, Nope, you know, you got to keep fighting. You got to keep going for this and you got to keep pushing. And there may be a day where you lean into it. I don't know. I experienced depression myself and, um, there, I know there are certain days I just know I just need to go to bed and sleep it off and I'm going to be totally unproductive and try again the next day. And that's something that is, you know, it's okay. It's okay to not be productive. That's a hard thing for a type A personality, which a lot of athletes are. Um, but it's hard to, to give yourself permission to do that. But as long as you're continuing to come back to the fight and the drive, it doesn't mean you have to have that fight in you every single moment of every single day. Um, that is, I think, a myth about what it is to be a fighter. Um, sometimes you can just be still, you can just rest and you can just be okay that like, there's nothing that's going to change about this today. I just, it stinks and that's warranted. <laughs> it's a pandemic. Um, tell me this, you guys, anyone who wants to take this, what would you say to an athlete? We kind of hit on this earlier, but what would you say to an athlete who's hesitant to reach out because they feel a certain measure of guilt or shame that like, yes, everyone's going through this with the pandemic and my, my whole team is in the same situation. Um, I'm not special in that way, but I'm really struggling. Like, what would you say to that athlete who hasn't given themselves permission to vocalize that, that difficulty because they feel like they don't somehow earn it because everyone's going through this? I would just say, you know, kind of going back to the idea that there's power and vulnerability. I know that Christine, I was on a podcast with you a couple episodes ago and, um, the, um, professional that you interviewed prior to us, you know, having a huddle, um, talked about how, um, they were on a zoom call and they just had all the, it happened to be boys players, um, right in the chat, you know, how they were doing. And one person said like, I'm really struggling. Like this is super difficult for me. I've even cried all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it was like, me too, me too, me too, me too, me too. And almost everyone else on the team also said it. And so just because you think, you know, everybody isn't struggling with this or everybody is struggling with this because we're all in the same predicament. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't reach out because I think that there's power in being able to help each other. Like you're a team, you're a unit, you're a family. And so that's just more than um, scoring goals or winning games. You know, that's like going through life together. You need teammates. So whether it's, you know, family or whether it's your actual teammates or whether it's friends outside of sports, like being able to have a team you know, come together and huddle around you is important. And I think that being able to talk about it with each other um, will just give you hope that, okay, you can get through it because you're going to get through it together. Jonathan, you going to add to that? Yeah, it, I, you know, just the question brought up to, you know, I'm a high school football coach now and it's, this season was by far, one of the most difficult seasons as a player, as a coach that I've ever had to witness. Um, every week, we didn't know if we were going to have another week of playing. 
And, you know, we went from having a season of, you know, 11, 12 games, we got to play four games, you know, seniors this year got to play four games. That was it. And it was a struggle and it was so hard. And you saw kids um, break down every single day. And it was so, it was so refreshing and something I I really respect with our head coach at the school that I I coach. Uh, He's such an amazing guy and he has so much compassion for the kids on just a whole nother level that I have never witnessed as, as a player or as a coach that this, like this guy, he checks in, he cares, you know, a kid's breaking down, a kid's not doing well. He doesn't come at him with this hard mentality. He comes at him from this, this compassionate, loving position. And he has gotten so far with the players. And I think it's so amazing to kind of witness that, to have like a coach, like take that extra mile and do that after every practice, like he's telling the kids, like, come to me, if something's going on, like, I need to know, like, I need to hear, you know, he's checking on them. He has, you know, we talked about the, you know, Jack had mentioned like this open door policy earlier. Um, He truly has that. Um, And, and he really fosters that with his coaching staff too. So I think that that's super important. And he really got a lot of players to open up and it was, and it was super cool because he also shared with the players that like, the coaches were going through the same thing. Us as coaches, like we were going through the exact same thing the players were like, you know, struggling with, you know, motivation with wanting to be there. Coaches were having a hard time because, you know, we weren't getting, uh, you know, the, the, the excitement that you would get from a normal person. You know, you're playing a game on a Friday afternoon at two o'clock with no fans in the stadium and nothing there. And kids are having a hard time, but like the coaches was sharing our head coach was sharing what he was struggling with, which got the kids to open up because the kids were like, Oh, coach Burton is, you know, he's having a hard time. You know, there was one practice, like he straight up cried in practice. He's like, I'm having a hard time. He's like, I I've thought about quitting. I've, and the kids like really opened up and like talked to him. And I thought that was the most powerful thing as a coach that you could do. And I, and I really wish that was more of a standardized thing because he's an amazing coach and he's, he's done so well with his players throughout the, the few years that I've had the pleasure of coaching with him. I think that's really incredible, Jonathan. I think a lot of coaches sometimes are fearful about opening that Pandora's box if they don't know what to do with it. And it's like, you don't have to have that pressure of knowing what to do with it. When you open up and you open that door for people, to, your, your team to be vulnerable, that oftentimes is enough because it frees people from this elephant in the room and they feel like they're the only one struggling that to that measure. And when we, we loosen that kind of expectation that, you know, life is fine. Life is good. Keep trucking away. Um, there's power in that. So, so thank you so much for that. We're going to wrap up. Um, and I know you guys are probably have more to say, but hopefully this can help you wrap up whatever it is you have left to say. Um, if you could go back to the time when you were beginning to struggle with mental health and you, you know, hadn't sought help and you were dealing with kind of all of that freshness, let's just say, and you could tell yourself one thing, what would you tell yourself? For therapy, I was actually asked to write like a letter to my old self (laughs) and above like all things, this was like the most like emotional thing I got asked to do as like a, um, coping thing and, um, therapeutic thing. And once I did it, I felt so much relief. And the main thing that I just kept saying was just like advocate for yourself. Like you don't, it's not your fault. This happened to you and use this as a growth opportunity. Don't, beat yourself up or put these expectations on yourself, you know, moving forward. And you're more than an athlete. I feel like we could repeat that all day, every day, but like, it took a really long time for me to, to, to say that to myself. Um, because it was my coping mechanism playing sports was, I didn't even realize it till I got hurt. Like I said, that it was my way of dealing with any stress that came in my life. And, um, you know, it's just use this as a way to get more tools in your tool belt. And, and like I said, advocate for yourself, no matter how hard that is to do, just like be your own biggest fan and tell yourself like self-care priorities. Like that's the biggest thing. 
It's really good. Um, would anyone want to add to that briefly? Just uh, another couple little thoughts. Um, I a couple things actually. Just kind of the last few things we've talked about have sparked something. Um, one, I think it, that idea of more than an athlete, like truly, like you have to believe that. I wish I would have known that back then. Cause I don't think I realized how much I put my identity into, um, my sports being on a team, my, my performance, um, how hard I worked, um, how well I did or what I couldn't do and what my limits were like all of those things identified me for better or for worse. And I think that if I could have simply ran or played just simply because I loved it. And regardless of the outcome of any race I ran or any game I played or whatever, um, like I was still loved and appreciated and worthy and just enough because I'm Alyssa and not because I, I scored three goals, not because I got, you know, second overall in the meet, not because anything. Um, but because simply I'm just me um, and I'm loved because of that. And furthermore, I think it's important to realize you're, you're created for more than simply winning or losing um, or working hard or not, or getting personal bests or not. Um, you're, you have far more purpose than simply something so small. Um, and I think that's hard to believe and see, especially when you're in the midst of everything. And I think that pulling away, even through this pandemic of, um, you know, not having sports to watch and not being able to play your sports. I think that, or even with me not being able to coach, um, I think that shows like there's far more to life and you're still loved even so, you know, like everyone, everyone's in this, in this predicament. So it's a good example of advocate for yourself, but also you're still loved anyway. You know, you can't play your sport, but you're still loved and appreciated and people care about you. Um, and I think too, kind of a little tidbit for coaches, because hopefully there's some coaches listening as well. I think that, you know, all of us have seemed to have a coaching situation where maybe it wasn't super supportive or maybe, um, maybe, you know, they said one thing that really like just hurt your heart and you carried that around with you. And that was so much weight through whatever you were going through, whether it was anxiety or injury or depression or all of it. Um, and so I want to just say that like words matter and you have, you have to choose them wisely. And even if you have the best intention, make sure you look at human first. Um, because if kids are brave enough to speak out and talk about um, an issue that they're having, which I hope, I hope they are. And I'm, I hope that this podcast shows them to advocate for themselves, but coaches have to remember that like, there's a human factor. They're not just a player and they're not just a pawn that plays on the team, like they're human and they struggle and there's a lot of weight on their shoulders being on the team. And so just kind of a tidbit there too. coming, you know, now that I'm a coach, I realize now through all of what I've been through that that's so important and it's so important to be open and be able to talk about that stuff too. I appreciate that. That was really, really good. Uh, so Jackie and Alyssa said a lot there. Uh, Jonathan, Aaron, anything to add to that? Or did, did they kind of capture everything? I think about what I would say to myself. And I know I'm way too stubborn and thick-headed um, to have that sink in. So it's, I mean, it's been 10 years since I last played. And I still am struggling with what Alyssa was just talking about. So I think for me, the one thing I would say to myself is find a therapist earlier than I did because it's not something, it's not a, a math problem that you can solve in five minutes. It's a, it's a lifetime of work. And so finding the right person can just help you work through all the struggles that you're gonna find in life. For sure. I think, you know, I'm sitting there trying to think about like what I would say to my younger self and like, you know, just having this moment to reflect you know, I think if anything, if I could go back and like, you know, one of my lowest moments is, you know, just tell them like, you're going to like, you're going to get through this. Like it's, it's going to be something that you're going to get through. I just remember things being like so bleak at the time. 
you know, and especially like when I was at my lowest point and I'm sitting here, you know, planning suicide, like I'm planning, like, this is it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm ending it. I'm done. I can't, I can't go forward. Like I can't spend another day going through this. And, you know, I, I got the help I needed and I got the tools I needed and I got the resources I needed. And, you know, I'm right there with everybody that's here is that idea that like my only coping skill ever was playing sports. Like I hated going to practice when I was depressed. It was the worst thing in the world and having to slam into other people and hit people and like feeling like my body was going to crumble and feeling like I had the flu every day. Cause I would just have these horrible body aches for no apparent reason because I was just so depressed. I just every single day I just like, I, I, I don't know how I got through every day, but you know, I did it and I got through it. And, and when I was on the field and I had moments where I was around people, that was my coping skill. And then when that was taken away from me, like I had nothing left. My, my identity was completely blank. It was just like, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I belonged. I was a father, you know, I was a husband at the time. I had all these great things but none of that mattered because I couldn't put a helmet on anymore. Like it didn't matter that I had, you know, three amazing kids could have cared less as terrible as that sounds. And I love my kids more than anything. They're the most important thing to me. But when I was, when I was fresh out of playing, that wasn't enough. Like that just wasn't enough to get me through, you know, here are these three, you know, tiny human beings that, you know, I've helped create that are, you know, supposed to bring all this joy. And I'm, over here feeling so sorry for myself because I can't play like I can't play I can't you know be a part of it and I'm so just let down and like now that I've been able to cope and I've been able to you know understand what depression looks like and my anxiety and my just my overall mental health I've been able to shift but like just going back and telling myself like you'll get through this it's gonna be okay like you know get out of these negative thoughts, get out of your head, stop, you know, just going about that. Um, You know, use the tools that you've been given and just be more open with yourself and give yourself some credit. Don't beat the hell out of yourself every single day. Like give yourself some credit because, you know, as everybody in this room probably knows, like when you are depressed and you are anxious, the hardest thing in the morning thing to do is wake up in the morning and literally sit up in bed. That's like, for me, that was the hardest thing to do is just to sit up. It was incredibly hard, but I did it. And I would imagine we all did it. And so like, we have to give ourselves some credit on that because that takes a huge amount of courage to just be able to sit up and get up and brush your teeth and walk out the door when so many people give up on that and they just don't even make it to that point. So the fact that we are able to do that speaks volumes. And that's a great note to end on. Give yourself grace and give yourself some credit because what you're going through is tremendously difficult and you're not intended to do that alone. And, you know, there is support that you have access to lean into that support. Um, Thank you guys so much. I think this particular recording is going to, is going to transform lives. It's going to free, um, it's going to break athletes down. I I wouldn't be surprised if there's athletes in tears right now because you're saying the things they're feeling. And I think you all know what I mean by that, uh, that breakdown, because when you hear someone else say what you're feeling and you didn't know that was normal or that was okay, or other people had the same experience, um, it can be a very freeing thing. So we're going to be putting together a list of resources that are going to help you guys you know, find out where to go from here, where, where else can, you know, you learn about mental health. Can you take a mental health assessment online? Yes, you can. You can find out um, what's recommended for you. Um, and, and like, what kind of, you know, do you have just like normal depression where all of us are you know, upset right now because of what's going on? Or you do, you have something that you're experiencing something that requires some professional help. We're going to give you some of those tools. Um, but Alyssa, Aaron, Jackie, Jonathan, I can't thank you enough for being a part of this today. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks, guys.